Well, good morning again, friends. It's a blessing to be able to be together. Uh, even though we're not really together, I know that in spirit we're together. I don't know if I'll ever really get used to just speaking here to a, pretty much an empty auditorium, speaking into a camera, but uh, I'm really longing for the time when we're able to get back together and meet in person, as I'm sure all of you are as well. Uh, but I'm also extremely thankful to God that his word continues to go forth, that uh, we're having new and, and unique opportunities to spread the message of the gospel. I also am thankful uh, for the fact that as, I, as I've been checking up on uh, various folks and as I listen to the things that are coming and see the various emails that are coming back and forth, I can tell that many of you are, are taking care of one another, checking in with each other, calling each other on the phone, uh, demonstrating your love for one another. I also know that many of you are making efforts uh, to be helpful to others around you and to be helpful in our community. And many of you have asked, what are some ways that we can help uh, during this time? So I just want to say first this morning, thank you. Thank you to all of you for being the church. Uh, as we've said many times before, the church is not the building. We, as the people of God, we are the church. And so in many ways, a number of you have demonstrated that you are being the church. And also, many of you have expressed that you're praying for me and praying for Justin during these days. And I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 16 today, so I would encourage you to open your Bibles there, um, and I'm just going to begin with a brief word of prayer here, and then we'll jump into our text for today, okay? Father, thank you so much for the privilege of being a part of the family of God. Thank you, Lord, for the ways in which uh, your Spirit has been at work in lives of people around us, in the lives of people who don't yet know you, I know that you are drawing people to yourself. You are convicting people of sin. You are opening blind eyes to the truth. And we pray that you would continue to do that. We also thank you, Lord, for the ways in which you have been providing comfort to those who are in need of comfort during these times. The ways in which you are lifting our spirits and and continuing to allow us to, uh, to demonstrate love for one another during these times. I'm so grateful, Lord, for the way that you continue to work. And Father, we continue to, to ask you that, that the time would come very soon when we would be able to once again meet together uh, in person, face to face, and, and worship you together. Uh, but Lord, we thank you that wherever we are, wherever we are uh, spending time in prayer, wherever we are in your word, wherever we are singing songs of worship to you, you are there in our midst. And we praise you for that. We ask that you would um, guide our time in your word this morning, that you would speak to us, that your spirit would impart these truths clearly to our hearts and our minds. We pray this in Jesus' great name. Amen. Well, of course, last week was Resurrection Sunday, and so we took a, a we sped ahead a little bit in our study of 1 Corinthians and looked at a couple verses in chapter 15. The week prior to that, Justin spoke on the first five verses of chapter 2, and I thought he did a tremendous job uh, with that text, and I'm thankful for that. I especially appreciated the way he pointed out the emphasis on the Trinity that we saw in those first five verses. So before we get to um, the passage that I want to speak on today, I'm going to go ahead and read those five verses again, uh, just so that we get the context of where we're going to be in today's text. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So that's the backdrop before we're going to get to the verses that we'll look at today in verses 6 through 16. 
You should have gotten an email that had a link to sermon notes. If you want to uh, print those up and be following along in the outline, there's also a link to it at the bottom of this uh, sermon video on YouTube. But the, number, the first point that you're going to see uh, is that we impart a wisdom of God. That's number one in your outline. We impart a wisdom of God. Let's look at verses 6 through 9. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. So, again, number one, we impart a wisdom of God. Uh, I read in one Bible study guide this week this, this interesting note where the writer said, Many people think Christianity is for the mindless and dull. Someone has said, I feel like unscrewing my head and putting it underneath the pew every time I go to church. Unfortunately, this chapter has been used to support an uneducated, unthinking approach to Christianity. But this misses Paul's point. As Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, once said, Christ doesn't destroy reason, he dethrones it. He dethrones reason, he doesn't destroy it. Well, we impart a wisdom of God. You might notice here in verse 6 that there's a change in the pronoun from I to we. Notice in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 2, Paul says I, 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 my. He uses that first person singular. Here in verses 6, he switches to we. We impart wisdom. We impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. Now, some have made a, a, a big to-do about the fact that he switches the pronouns, and there's different uh, opinions about why he does that. But here's what uh, one writer said. I believe this was David Pryor. He said, It has been argued that there's no particular significance in the switch from I to we and back to I, which he switches back to I uh, in chapter 3, verse 1. It is then suggested that Paul is describing the norm in most churches, stressing the wealth of divine wisdom available to those who are not immature like the Christians at Corinth, those who are spiritual or mature and press forward in experiencing through the Spirit all that God has given to us in Jesus, can then say with Paul, we have the mind of Christ, which we'll see at the end of this chapter. Now notice this remarkable phrase in verse 7, where Paul describes God's wisdom as that which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Isn't that interesting? He describes God's wisdom as that which God decreed before the ages for our glory. This gives us an eternal perspective on the wisdom of God. Again, one commentator said, Basically, Paul is saying that in his wisdom, God decided on Jesus Christ and him crucified as the way of salvation long before time began, long before he created us in his own image, as he says, before the ages. More than that, from eternity, he planned to bring all his saints to share his glory. He says, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Um, he says, yet among the mature in verse 6, we impart a wisdom, though, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age. Again, that ties into what he had said in verses uh, 1 through 5, that, that his message was not in the, the wisdom of this world, but it was in the power of the Spirit. And there's such a huge difference between the, the natural inclinations of humankind. What, what mankind thinks is wise is so different 
than what God describes as wisdom. This mystery that Paul speaks about here is, is, something, is not something additional to the saving message of Christ crucified. It is Christ crucified. It is in Christ crucified that the wisdom of God is embodied. In verses 1 through 5, again, he talked about knowing nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then in these verses, when he speaks about the wisdom of God, he's, a, he's continuing that thought. That the wisdom of God is best described and, and revealed in Jesus Christ and him crucified. One writer said uh, this wisdom consists in the detailed, the more detailed unfolding of the divine purpose of God, which is summed up in Christ crucified. So we never move on from the cross of Christ only into a more profound understanding of the cross. Paul does not have a, a simple gospel of the cross for, for babies in Christ and then a different wisdom gospel for the mature. All Christians are, are potentially mature in Christ, though only some are actually what all ought to be. Now notice then he says, none of the rulers of this age understood this. What did they not understand? They did not understand the wisdom of God. They did not understand the plan of God for salvation when he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And Paul says, if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Look at those who were the rulers in that day in, at the end of Jesus' earthly life, and they clearly did not understand. The Roman authorities did not understand. The, the Jewish religious leaders did not understand. But it was all part of God's plan from before the ages that Christ would be crucified. But it makes clear that it was not the idea of men. It was not the wisdom of men that led to the plan of salvation. It was the design of God from the very beginning. But he says, if these rulers would have understood, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. I love that way of describing Jesus, the Lord of glory. Because they didn't understand that he was indeed the Christ, he was indeed the Messiah, they crucified him. And because the rulers of the age today don't understand, they refuse to bow the knee to the Lord of glory. In fact, every person who has yet to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord, has yet to trust in him as, as the one who can save them, from sin. They are described by these same words. They did not understand. Everyone who understands the message, the plan of God for salvation, will bow the knee to Jesus Christ and recognize him as the Lord of glory. And then in verse 9, he says, As it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard. And he's quoting from Isaiah. Isaiah 64, verse 4 says it this way. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. So Paul takes that message from Isaiah and says, nobody has seen, nobody has heard, no one has understood. No, no human logic comes to the conclusion of, of the plan of salvation given to us through Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's not an invention of human reasoning. It's the power of the Spirit of God and the wisdom of God given to us. So we impart or we speak a wisdom of God. And number two in your outline, number two, we receive the Spirit of God. We receive the Spirit of God. Look at verses 10 through 13. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, 
not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Now, from this point on, in verses 10 through 16, Paul explains in detail, the, in some detail, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in revealing to us Jesus as the wisdom of God. This ministry is essential because without it, we could never understand the thoughts of God. Notice what he says there in verse 11. Who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What is Paul saying? Left to ourselves, humankind would not be able to understand God's thoughts, the things that God thinks, the the words that he has written down for us. No human reasoning can understand God. God is, is infinite and we are finite. God is, is matchless in his splendor. Uh, our finite minds cannot wrap, wrap themselves around all of the greatness of who God is and all of his attributes. The only way that we can come to a place where we understand the things of God, the message of salvation, the truth about God's Son, the only way we can understand these things is if we are receiving the Spirit of God and He explains these things to us. Notice what He says in verse 10, the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. And He enables all believers to come to know and to impart and to interpret all that God has given to us in Jesus. When Jesus was preparing His disciples For the fact that he would be leaving the earth one day, he promised them that he was going to send them a gift. And it's always amazed me, in fact, that Jesus said, it will be better for you that I go away. I've always read his words when he said that and just been amazed. How could it possibly be better for followers of Jesus that Jesus would go away, that he would ascend back to heaven? Well, He told us why. He told his disciples why it would be better for them when he leaves. In John 14, 26, this is what he promised. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So Jesus, it seems, was describing to his disciples the fact that even while they were with him, uh, while they went around with him during those three years of his ministry on earth, they still struggled to understand often the things that he said, didn't they? They frequently misunderstood what he was saying. They often were were way out of line in, in their response to the things that he was saying. They were frequently confused. Why? Because they were still operating dependent upon their own human understanding. And so many times Jesus spoke in parables, and then you'll see as you read through the Gospels that later, often he would interpret those parables to his disciples. He would explain clearly to those who were closest to him what he was saying and what he was meaning by the various uh, parables that he told. But without him clearly explaining it, oftentimes they just didn't get it. And he says, when the helper comes, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And we see that as we go through our New Testament, especially when we see after the Holy Spirit comes upon the early church, the first church at at the time of Pentecost, that from that point on, those who were in Christ, those who had received the Holy Spirit, had a much greater understanding of all that Jesus had said and all that Jesus had done. They had a clearer grasp of the thoughts of God, the intentions of God, because they received the helper from above, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father sent in the name of Jesus Christ. 
One example of that radical transformation is Peter, which our, in our church we recently did a study of the life of Peter. And you can see pretty radically how he was operating often according to human logic. He was thinking uh, as Peter thinks many times as we see him in the Gospels. But following his, his uh, reception of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, we see a radical transformation in Peter where he seems to fully understand much greater the things of God, the thoughts of God, the plan of salvation, what Jesus uh, was here to do, what he accomplished, and all that he wants to accomplish in our lives. In fact, Peter had such a greater understanding of the thoughts of God that we have two books in our New Testament, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, that he wrote demonstrating great understanding. And of course, the Holy Spirit uh, worked through Peter to write those two letters. Friends, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've placed your trust in him, the Bible promises that we have received the Spirit of God so that We can understand the thoughts of God so that we can read God's word and and the spirit of God within us helps us to understand it. He interprets these spiritual truths to us and only the Holy Spirit can fully do that. Again, to look at verse 11, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. That reminds me again of a verse I've mentioned numerous times where Isaiah said, "My God speaking through Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so far are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I also think of Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, that says, The Spirit of man is the lamp of of the Lord, searching all his innermost parts. So who can understand the thoughts of a person except for the spirit of that person? Who can understand the thoughts of God? Only the spirit of God and those who have received the spirit of God can understand the thoughts of God. And where do we find the thoughts of God? He's written them down for us in this uh, special revelation is the, the doctrinal term for it. The special revelation of the scriptures, God's holy word. He has lined out for us his very thoughts. And as we spend time in his word, reading it, and we ask the Lord to help us to understand it, the spirit of God helps us to interpret, to understand the things of God, the thoughts of God. I hope that you have experienced, and if you haven't, I hope that you'll, you'll pray that this will become a part of your life. As you read God's word and maybe chew on a verse, maybe write it down in a journal, there are times when I'm reading something in scripture where I know that the spirit of God is speaking very personally to me through the words that I'm reading. Uh, sometimes there will be a verse that almost literally jumps off the page. Now, of course, it's not the, the, the ink jumps off the page and I see it suddenly in 3D, but it almost feels like that sometimes. Have you experienced that? Where there's something that you're reading and suddenly it's like, boom, the Spirit of God takes the words of God and helps you understand God's thoughts and applies them to your heart. And sometimes when I get a clear grasp of the thoughts of God as the Spirit of God helps me understand the words of God. There's times where I'm deeply convicted and I have to repent and say, thank you, Lord, for revealing that to me, even though it hurt. There's times when that happens where I'm incredibly encouraged. And this is a time where where many, many people, as I've been reading, many people around the world and here in America especially seem to be going through times of sadness and and depression and anxiety and worry. And if we would be in the word of God and allowing the spirit of God to speak to us through his word, I believe we can find great comfort. The spirit of God will comfort us through the words of God. The, The spirit of God will encourage us through the words of God. The Spirit of God will give us uh, comfort, encouragement, strength, peace, and no more worry. He'll give us a courage to face this day. 
David Pryor says it is in this section in verses 12 through 13 that the we vocabulary most naturally refers to the specific ministry of Paul and his fellow apostles. And then he says this, although every Christian is potentially enabled by the Spirit to understand, impart, and interpret all that God in his grace has bestowed on us, the apostolic teaching about the salvation of God in Jesus has unique authority of the kind described in verse 13. We impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. And then he finishes by saying this, as well as rejecting once again the eloquence of worldly wisdom, Paul here maintains that his teaching in its language as well as in its substance is supplied by the Holy Spirit. The words he uses verbalize the thoughts of God and thereby are enshrined by the authority of God. In other words, the, the words of Scripture that we have in the Old and the New Testaments are spoken authoritatively by the Spirit of God through his servants who have written down his words for us. Well, I was reading an article in this um, magazine I get from Christianity Today specifically for pastors and there's an article in there about how to, uh, how to counsel those who are going through difficult times by a man named Harold Sinkbile. And he, and he specifically quoted in that article, verses 12 and 13 of 1 Corinthians 2. And he said this, When we speak, talking about us as pastors, but this could be true of anyone who's ministering to someone else. When we speak... We need more than human wisdom. We need instruction from God's own spirit by means of his word. Likewise, what we bring to people by the power of God's spirit, they are able to receive only because they are spiritual, meaning they themselves have received the spirit by baptism into Christ. What was he saying there to, to us as pastors and to anyone else who might counsel others or try to encourage someone else? We don't need human wisdom. Uh, we could read all of the, the wisdom of this world, everything that it has to offer in, in books or on the internet or whatever, but we don't need human wisdom. We need the wisdom that comes from God as God's spirit instructs us through God's words. But the people who we're sharing with and we're trying to minister to, they also can only receive that wisdom if they too have the Spirit of God dwelling within them. And if you are a person who has uh, placed your trust in Christ, if you're born again, then the Bible says you have received the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God will help a person to receive the wisdom of God when someone else is trying to share it with you. So that was number two. Number three we have the mind of Christ. I love this phrase. We have the mind of Christ. Look at verses 14 through 16. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Wow, we have the mind of Christ. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit is necessary. Not only, one writer says, for the instruction, the illumination, and the enabling of apostolic messengers, but for those who hear them. The man who has not received the Spirit, which is described here in verse 14 as the natural person, does not have the resources within himself or within herself to recognize or appreciate or welcome what the Spirit wants to impart through his words. In verses 12 through 14, Paul uses six important verbs to describe the ministry of the Spirit to those who teach and those who hear the gospel. So for those who teach the gospel, the Holy Spirit enables to know, to declare, and to explain. Again, those who are speaking the gospel, teaching the gospel, the Holy Spirit enables to know, 
to declare and to explain. And those who are learning, those who are hearing the message of the gospel, the Holy Spirit enables to receive, to understand, and to appreciate. To receive, to understand, and to appreciate. Without that kind of ministry from the Spirit, there can be no communication and and no growth into maturity. The truths of God are not able to be comprehended without the Spirit of God. In fact, he even says, for the person without the Spirit, the things of the Spirit of God are folly, or they seem as foolishness. And that's, that's what we see, especially as we, as we think about what we just talked about recently with the passion of Christ and his crucifixion. And we look at those who were the religious authorities of that day or even the, the governmental authorities of that day. The message of God that was being brought to them in the person of Jesus Christ seemed like foolishness. And it's what Paul has said earlier here in Corinthians, that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But it is the power of God for us who believe. One writer said, we can begin to see why Paul must have felt so frustrated by the sheer fleshliness or carnality of the Christians at Corinth. And I'm sure it's only the Christians at Corinth that uh, experienced fleshliness or carnality. But this writer goes on to say, they, like all Christians, had access to the very mind of Christ, but they were precluding themselves from the privilege of being able, by the work of the Spirit, to judge all things through God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ, the very wisdom of God. He was frustrated, I'm sure, because though they had the resources at their disposal, they were not taking advantage of what was offered to them in the Spirit. And so they were were behaving not according to the Spirit, but according to the flesh. Paul would describe that same frustration in Galatians. As he spoke, uh, as he wrote in the letter to the Galatians about walking in the flesh compared to walking in the Spirit. Even those of us who have received the Spirit of God can sometimes still live according to the flesh. And it's a continual challenge to us and a continual command to be filled with the Spirit, but also to walk in the Spirit. And to walk in the Spirit is to walk in the truths of God, to receive the truth of God and the thoughts of God through His Word, and then to obey those things, to to live out those things in our lives. Again, verse 15 says, The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. I like how it says it in Proverbs 28, verse 5. Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Evil men don't understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Proverbs 28, 5. But then here's that question in verse 16, for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13, the prophet said, who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? In other words, no one can instruct the Lord. And that's the question that's being asked. Who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But then he says, but we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Think about that for a moment. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? As he's talked throughout this passage of understanding the thoughts of God. And the thoughts of God are understandable when we have the Spirit of God. And the thoughts of God, the plans of God, were best revealed to us in the person of God the Son, Jesus Christ. And he says, we have the mind of Christ. That takes me back a little bit to to the time when in John chapter 15 when Jesus was speaking to his disciples and he says this very amazing statement to them. John chapter 15, verse 15. 
He says, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. What a phenomenal statement. I've all, as I've talked about before, what an incredible Bible study it would be to be on the road to Emmaus with Jesus and those two disciples after his resurrection as he explained to them all the things in the scriptures and how it all pertained to him. But think about those disciples spending three years in close personal contact, part of Jesus' small group, and not just some sort of a, a weekly small group Bible study, but a daily living in his presence. And he says to them, I'm no longer call, calling you servants. I'm now calling you friends. Why? Why can he call them friends? He says, why? For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. We are the friends of the Lord Jesus Christ if we are followers of his, if we trust in him, if we walk with him daily, he calls us his friends. And what does he do for his friends? Everything that he's heard from his father, he says, I have made known to you. And I believe that Jesus is still making known to us all that he has heard from his father. And we have it written down for us in the Bible. What incredibly blessed people we are. We don't have to wonder at what God is thinking. We don't have to, to guess as to what God wants to say to us. We don't have to go out to some distant mountain, uh, cross our legs and, and close our eyes and empty our mind and hope that God will fill it with his thoughts. We don't have to do any of that. Why? Because all that, he, all that he wants to say to us, he has revealed to us. And, and it's written down for us. We have the very thoughts of God handed down to us. We have them written down for us. And we have the spirit of God given to us. We have the mind of Christ so that as we spend time digesting his thoughts through his words, we can know what he wants to say to us. We can know what he wants to teach us. We can understand the thoughts of God, not by ourselves. We have nothing to boast about, just as, as Paul would say, you know, we, I, don't, I can only boast in Jesus Christ. I personally have nothing to boast about. I can't boast about my salvation because that's all of Christ. And the same is true when it comes to our understanding of the things of God. We shouldn't be puffed up and think, oh, I understand the things of God. I know what God is thinking. No, it's all God's grace. It's all God's mercy. It's all because of the Spirit of God. It's all because he's called us his friends and we have the mind of Christ. It's nothing of our flesh. It's nothing about our human intellect. It's all about the Spirit of God that's been given to every believer in Jesus Christ, that we have his Spirit interpreting these spiritual truths for us, and we've been given the mind of Christ. What a blessing. That's what's also so phenomenal about the gospel, as I've talked about before, that, the, that the, at the foot of the cross, the playing field is leveled. From the people who might be considered, according to this world, the brightest of the bright, to the people who might be considered the dullest of the dull, every one of us in between those two extremes can understand the things of God. We can, we can understand the thoughts of God. We, can, we have made known to us and revealed to us the mysteries of God from the, the things that God has planned for the world from ages past, it says, because he has given us of his spirit. Whether, we're, whether we have an incredibly high IQ or a terribly low IQ, if we have the spirit of God, we can understand the truths of God. That's a beautiful thing about the gospel. The Christian faith is not just for the intellectually elite. It's also not only for the intellectually destitute. There are incredibly intellectually bright people 
who are believers in Jesus Christ and understand the truths of God. There are also people who are very simple and maybe have a low IQ and maybe according to the thoughts of this world are not incredibly intelligent and yet they understand the gospel message. They understand God's love for them. They understand that Christ died on the cross for them. They can understand the things that God has said to them in his word. Why? Because we have received the spirit of God, everyone who is in Christ, and because we have the mind of Christ. I found uh, two notes in the Life Application Bible especially helpful this week, so I just want to conclude with, with these two thoughts, again, that I thought were just very helpful and applicable to us. The first note says this, Non-Christians cannot understand God, and they cannot grasp the concept that God's Spirit lives in believers. Don't expect most people to approve of or understand your decision to follow Christ. It all seems so silly to them. Just as the tone-deaf person cannot appreciate fine music, the person who rejects God cannot understand God's beautiful message. With the lines of communication broken, he or she won't be able to hear what God is saying to him or her. And so I thought that note made a lot of sense. And, and as we try to explain the things of God uh, to our friends, we have to pray that the Spirit of God will enlighten their minds, will remove the blinders from their eyes, will help them to understand, because left to themselves, left to their own human intellect, they won't be able to. And even as you speak to them, it will sound like foolishness. So don't be surprised and don't be discouraged when you're trying to share your faith in Jesus Christ with someone and they act or even say that it just is foolishness. It just sounds crazy. The second note said this, which I also thought was very helpful. It says, no one can comprehend God, but through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Believers have insight into some of God's plans, thoughts, and actions. They, in fact, have the mind of Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, we can begin to know God's thoughts, talk with Him, and expect His answers to our prayers. And then it asks these questions, or this, this one question. Are you spending enough time with Christ to have His very mind in you? I asked that question of myself, and I would ask it of you as well. Are you spending enough time with Christ to have his very mind in you? And it goes on to say, an intimate relationship with Christ comes only from spending time consistently in his presence and in his word. And then it said this, read Philippians 2, 5 through 11 for more on the mind of Christ. And so that did take me to, to think about what does Philippians 2 say. Listen to what Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11 says, but especially notice how it starts. And tie this in with what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 2. We have the mind of Christ. Now notice what he says in Philippians 2, 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. That's how he starts. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. It's very similar to what he said here. We have the mind of Christ. But in Philippians 2, it's a command from Paul. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have the mind of Christ. And Paul tells us there in Philippians 2 what the mind of Christ is. That is humbling himself, 
being obedient to his father, making himself nothing, dying on the cross. My friends, if what we've been with what i've been sharing with you or if anything about the message of the gospel of jesus christ seems like foolishness to you i pray for you who might be hearing this right now i am praying that god through his holy spirit will soften your heart will remove the blinders from your eyes will make it clear in your mind and in your heart the truths that he has declared in his word about his son, Jesus Christ. And if God is stirring in you right now, bringing you to to a moment of, of clarity, of understanding that yes, yes, you are a sinner, but yes, Jesus Christ died for those sins. Yes, Jesus Christ came to this earth to save you. And God loved you enough that he gave his very best, his son, who was obedient to the point of death on a cross. If the spirit of God is even now clarifying in your mind these truths, then I would ask you even now, surrender to Jesus. Surrender to him as your Lord. Cry out to him to save you from sin. Experience the new birth being born again to a living hope, having your sins forgiven, washed away, cleansed eternally, giving giving you the hope of eternal life. Surrender to him, cry out to him, pray to him and say, Lord Jesus, save me. And I pray that you will experience that new birth, that you will receive the spirit of God in your life and the thoughts of God given to us in the the Bible will begin to make sense to you. My friends, what an incredible promise. What an incredible truth. We have the mind of Christ. We have received the spirit of God. And so we are able to impart the very truths of the wisdom of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your incredible love for us. Thank you for who you are, God. Even though in our finite minds we struggle to understand, yet you have given us your spirit so that that who you are and what you think and what you say can begin to make sense to us. Thank you, Father God, for who you are. Thank you, Jesus Christ, God the Son, for what you have done for us. Thank you, Spirit of God, third member of the Trinity. Thank you for coming to us and clarifying to us the thoughts of God through the words of God. Father, Son, and Spirit, we love you today, the one true and living God. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for freeing us from guilt and condemnation. We thank you for freeing us from slavery to sin. We thank you for imparting to us your wisdom, giving us your very spirit, God. And I pray that we would live our lives as followers of Jesus, understanding that we have the mind of Christ. What a great promise for us. We pray all these things in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. God bless you, my friends. Thank you so much for being a part of this time of worship together. Now, go in God's peace and continue to walk in the Spirit because we have the mind of Christ.